try this. <laughs> try doing it. <laughs> yeah. What the heck? Get another one. I'm Mark Oppenlander, guitarist and co-founding member of the music group One Alternative. Oboist Jill Haley and I, along with guitarist Frank McDermott, formed the group back in 1983. I'm going to take you through the history of the group via a scrapbook and extra photos that I've compiled through the years. The beginnings of One Alternative occurred when I met Frank back in 1977. We both hailed from Westchester, Pennsylvania and discovered that each other was planning to attend music school at Temple University in Philadelphia. Frank started in 1977, and I followed in 1978. As we got to know each other, we found that our musical tastes were very much the same. I immediately saw that Frank was very creative with all kinds of interesting musical ideas to explore. On and off for about two years, we started working on some acoustic guitar music, trying to mix classical, rock, and folk styles together. Around 1980, we took a break from this work because basically we needed to put our energies into getting through music school. And this brings us to 1981, where I met Jill Haley at a Halloween party in the Temple dorms. Soon after, we became a couple, but interestingly enough, at least in my mind, we didn't consider combining her oboe playing with my guitar. We were both seniors at Temple, and I found myself concerned with what I was going to do after graduating. I set forth on a mission to meet as many musicians as possible and see where things go. One of these musicians was dulcimerist and singer-songwriter Kevin Roth. I gave him a tape of my classical guitar playing and he called me on Christmas Eve of 1981 about it. He particularly liked a piece of music by composer Francois Couperon named Le Barricade Mysterieuse. Kevin was recording an album and said he'd like me to play that piece while he added some dulcimer highlights on top. Almost in an afterthought he asked, do you know a French horn player? And I said, I do know a great English horn player. In January of 1982, Jill and I recorded a piece of music each on Kevin's album called Dulcimer Man. That spring, the three of us started making arrangements of his music for dulcimer, oboe, and guitar. We played a number of nice gigs, including a tour of local schools and Longwood Gardens in Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania. And the big gig, at least in my eyes, was playing in the 1982 Philadelphia Folk Festival. After recording a second album with Kevin, it became apparent that my increasing creative input was not what Kevin was comfortable with, so I was let go. On my own and not knowing quite what to do, I decided to get back in touch with Frank in early 1983. We went right back to those tunes that we started and picked up where we left off. Jill heard one of these pieces and said, I can hear English horn over that. So she went to work and came up with a beautiful part for the piece that was soon to be titled Underwater. Her writing was not conventional or boring. It was really interesting, beautiful, and fit perfectly with what Frank and I had already come up with. She was also becoming a very good improviser, so this was working out really well. Things felt right and very special, so we decided to work as a trio of oboe and two classical guitars. We needed a name for the trio. Frank came up with one alternative. His thought was that our sound was an alternative to whatever music one was already listening to. The yin-yang guitars and oboe design was thought up by an old friend, Jim Whitcraft. We also came up with a term to help describe our sound, and we still call it acoustic fusion. Our first public performance was on July 16, 1983 at the American Music Festival in Chester County's Nottingham Park. We were known as Frank McDermott. We decided to make a demo tape of the few compositions we had written, so I contacted John Venor at Widener University. John was the head of Widener's music department and an audiophile to boot. Through his guidance, Widener built a state-of-the-art studio that would be used by students and outside musicians. On December 4th, 1983, we rolled through three tunes and four hours of recording and mixing. 
We then sent demos to a number of people, including Gene Shea of WHYY FM in Philadelphia. Gene really liked our sound, and so he had us as a musical guest on his radio program the following April, giving us a full 45 minutes of airtime. Radio airplay outside of the Philadelphia area was a possibility, so the demo was sent to John Schaefer of WNYC in New York, and he played our music on his New Sounds show. The tape was also sent to record companies Rounder and Wyndham Hill. Each responded saying more or less, thank you for your submission, but your sound is not what we are looking for at this time. Can I mention that you almost got a, a recording on, on the Wyndham Hill label? Almost. Almost. There was a possibility that one uh, alternative might be part of a sampler album. And, and the thought flashed by while you were playing that maybe George Winston, see, who's in town playing tonight, you know, he might be listening to his car radio right now and say, hey, these people would be perfect <laughs> for our <laughs> label. I want to go call Ackerman as soon as they get back. <laughs> perfect for Wyndham Hill. Okay. In the midst of all this activity, the relationship between Jill and I became a platonic one. A great deal of discussion resulted in the decision to continue our musical work together. Our commitment to the music helped cement our very close friendship that continues to this day. <laughs> 